Okay, well, good morning, everyone, and good to see each of you out. And we are going to be, again, in the book of Daniel, so take your Bibles, if you will. Turn to Daniel and chapter number 2 this morning. Daniel chapter number 2. I'll keep you in Daniel chapter 2, so uh, we are going to, here this morning, chapter number 2, continue with our study on the book of Daniel and going through the entire book. Uh, this chapter, is, is uh, you may be familiar with, if not, uh, by the time we're done, I think you'll be a lot more familiar with it. it uh, this morning, we're going to uh, go through sort of the narrative, uh, the first half of the chapter, looking at, and the, the chapter gives us the, the story, the narrative of King Nebuchadnezzar and the dream that he had, and then also it uh, reveals to us uh, Daniel's interpretation. Now, uh, next week, next week we will begin to look at, uh, there's a lot of prophecy in the interpretation of the dream. Next week we are going to cover a lot of that, uh, looking at uh, what the dream actually means prophetically. But here this morning, what I'd like to do is, is begin uh, really in verse number 1 of Daniel chapter number 2 and cover the dream that the king had. And uh, the events here are, uh, that are recorded in this chapter happened in the second year of King Nebuchadnezzar, the Bible tells us, and would have been 602 B.C. And... Um, by now, Daniel uh, had been in uh, Babylon for a number of years. And so uh, I just really want to just get started at, at the beginning of the chapter, and we're just going to go through this. Uh, but Daniel uh, chapter number 2, if you're there, you can be following along in, uh, in uh, the book of Daniel. I'll be giving you a lot of other scripture up on the, the board but, or on the, the screen. But the first thing that verse number one starts off with is some distress that the king is having. And look here in verse number one. The Bible says this, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams, wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep break from him. And so the Bible says, uh, now we, we, we've covered chapter number one, of course, uh, as you look back, through there, we talked a lot about Daniel, his character, uh, his friends, and, and what was happening to Daniel at this time. Now, in history, we are, are fast-forwarding a few years, and the Bible tells us, we jump right into this narrative of where Dan, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is troubled. The Bible says his spirit was troubled, and he couldn't sleep. And so the spirit that's uh, dealing with inside of him, the uh, the real him was troubled, and you know this. Um, first of all, I guess I just want to say, first of all, this sort of thing still happens today, uh, does it not? Being troubled, not being able to sleep. In fact, many people today, uh, many people today, uh, you know, uh, many are are worried about the future. King Nebuchadnezzar at this time, understand this, he didn't know the Lord. The Bible says he. Uh, was dreaming, the spirit was troubled, and uh, he couldn't sleep, his sleep break from him. You know, today, many are just like King Nebuchadnezzar. They're worried about the future. And, you know, uh, that's what Jesus says over in Luke chapter 21 and verse number 26. Um, the Bible says this, men's hearts failing them for fear. And for the looking of those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. It's very easy to look around what's going on in society and to be troubled. And there are many uh, today in our society that are just like this. Now, uh, when you look in Luke chapter 21, understand this is Jesus speaking. And what he is describing is the last days, the days that uh, I believe and and many of you, I'm sure, we are living in those last days right now. Jesus is describing that, and a description of the last days is that men's hearts will fail them. And all you have to do is look around. And so King Nebuchadnezzar, 
uh, is experiencing this, this uh, worry about the future, his distress clearly seen. Jesus describes this in Luke chapter 21. In fact, perhaps what King Nebuchadnezzar was troubled with is what Jesus describes in the second verse up on the screen in verse 24. What Jesus is describing here in Luke, um, perhaps this is what King Nebuchadnezzar was troubled at because of the vision or the dream that was given to him. Jesus, and this is really the meaning of the dream. We're going to get into this. But notice what Jesus said. It says in verse 24, And they shall fall by, speaking of the Jerusalem, they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. Remember last week, that's what happened to Daniel. He was led away captive into Babylon. And then this, And Jerusalem shall be trodden down by the Gentiles. That was at the hand of King Nebuchadnezzar. God used King Nebuchadnezzar to overthrow, besiege Jerusalem. Jerusalem was trodden down, but look at the end of this verse that Jesus says, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Nebuchadnezzar, when we get into this dream that he had, the times of the Gentiles began when Jerusalem fell at the hands of Babylon and they end when Christ returns. And we're going to see here, this. You know, when we're talking about King Nebuchadnezzar, he was distressed in verse number 1. Why was he troubled within? Well, it was what he saw. The, 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 the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. And, he, and so perhaps this is part of the reason why he was distressed. But nonetheless, there are many today that are worried about the future and their hearts are failing them. Just giving you a sense of, this was not just, oh, Nebuchadnezzar waking up with a, um, a bad dream and uh, he just went on his day. No, this, this bothered him. Verse number one makes that very clear. Verse two, look here and we begin to see what Nebuchadnezzar desired here and we'll see the king's desire in verse number two. It says, then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. So uh, what did King Nebuchadnezzar do? He had this terrible night sleep. Uh, he couldn't sleep. He was troubled. His uh, heart was failing him. So what did he do? Well, he consulted or he, he gathered these four groups together and you understand this, these, these, the magicians, the astrologers, these, these were basically groups that really, they sought to flatter the king, really in a, sort of a more self-serving purpose. They were, they were there to, uh, for the king for sure, but they would want to say positive things to the king. The magicians, these were the enchanters, and uh, who doesn't like magicians? They're very entertaining. Um, Pharaoh, uh, we can go back to Exodus chapter number 7. Remember when the Lord was using Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. And uh, Moses went before Pharaoh. And, um, you know, God was working on Pharaoh's heart here. Pharaoh was troubled, was he not? Well, what did Pharaoh do? What did he turn to? Well, Exodus chapter 7 tells us that Pharaoh turned to the magicians the enchanters. In Exodus chapter uh, 7, verse 22, I'll read this. It says, And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments, and Pharaoh's heart was hardened, neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. And so the magicians didn't help Pharaoh, and uh, we're going to see the magicians couldn't help King Nebuchadnezzar either. There were the magicians, there were the astrologers, these were the astrologers were those, this group of, of people there in Babylon that observed the, the zodiac, the, the stars, the signs, uh, the charts, the calendars. That's what their focus was. The prophet Isaiah actually writes about Babylon and how uh, Babylon trusted in their own wisdom. And over in Isaiah 47 verse 13, 
uh, the prophet Isaiah says this about Babylon. He says, Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counselors, counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, the monthly pro, uh, prognosticator or the predictors stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. And so Babylon was known. They had the multitude of counselors. Now, this was, um, so they had magicians, astrologers. Uh, what, what else is mentioned? Verse number two, the sorcerers. Uh, Jeremiah warns, he, he's, he's actually warning Babylon, don't hearken to them. Over in Jeremiah chapter 27 and verse number nine, the prophet Jeremiah says, therefore, hearken not ye to your prophets, nor your diviners, nor your dreamers, nor to your enchanters, nor to your sorcerers. And so uh, these were the wizards uh, of the day there. And then the last group mentioned that the king, the king uh, turned to here, that verse 2 tells us, is the Chaldeans. Now, the Chaldeans, if you don't know who they were in this group of people, they were, they were really the scientists. They were astronomers. This was the educated class in Babylon at this time. Now, Daniel and his friends would have been part of this group, the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans were, they were the educated class there in Babylon. And, you know, uh, Babylon at this time became the center of intel, uh, intellectual life. If you wanted to study, uh, if you wanted to go to the best schools, they were in Babylon. And uh, we know that we talked about uh, last week or the week before how da Daniel went to the University of Babylon. I don't know if that's what it was called. But you know he was immersed in what? The tongues and the ways of the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans were the educated class. King Nebuchadnezzar turned to the Chaldeans, this group, to help with the interpretation or the 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 really understanding the dream, revealing the dream to him, and then the interpretation. The Chaldeans, actually, when you study them, they, for their time, they were very intelligent. Actually, uh, one of their contributions, now this goes back to, you know, the 1600 B.C., so what are we talking about? Almost, uh, we're talking at least 2,600 years ago, the Chaldeans, they contributed, one of their outstanding contributions was to determine a year to be 365 days, 6 hours, 15 minutes, and 42, 41 seconds. That's what they determined a year. You understand a year isn't exactly 365 days. I think we, well, we all understand that. That's why we have leap years. But you see, they were so precise... <laughs> in their calculation that back then, you know, they were only off 30 minutes. That's a, a, amazing for them. So the king looked to this group of experts to help, um, help him out and tell him, um, but no, uh, uh, tell them of his dream. But notice that the king, he's, he has a dilemma here because, or to, um, this is his dilemma. Verse number three goes on. They stood before the king, and the king said unto them, I have dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Then spake the Chaldeans to the king of Syriac, O king, live forever, tell thy servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. Here's the dilemma. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The thing is gone from me, if ye will not May, uh, he says, the thing's gone from me. That's quite the dilemma. He dreamed a dream. He wants to know what it is, the interpretation of it. So they come, these, these, the, the educated class stand before him and say, okay, well, just tell us the dream and we will work on the interpretation, get back to you. He says, I don't remember the dream. So, you know, understand this. The king, Nebuchadnezzar, why did he get the dream? Well, he got the dream because 
He was, you know, I know the kings are the Lord's servants. The Bible actually tells us this of Nebuchadnezzar in Jeremiah 27, uh, where the, uh, the word of God calls Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. You know, and in this sense, the king, he was a chosen vessel to receive this dream that would reveal great prophetic truth. That's what this dream revealed. So the king has a dilemma in verse number five, the first part of that. He doesn't remember the dream. Notice now his demand. Verse number five says, if ye will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, ye shall be cut in pieces, and your houses shall be made a dunghill. But if ye show the dream and the interpretation thereof, ye shall receive of me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream. And we will show the interpretation of it. They're saying, this isn't fair. You've got to tell us the dream. He's saying, I don't remember it. Verse number 8, the king answered and said, I know of certainty that ye will gain the time because ye see the thing is gone from me. But if ye will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you. For ye have prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that ye can show me the interpretation thereof. So the king has a dilemma. Now we see the king making a demand. You see, I, I, I like in verse 9, you see King Nebuchadnezzar, he knew these magicians. He knew that these astrologers, the Chaldeans, he knew that they had already prepared something to tell him. Uh, he, he said, you've already prepared lying and corrupt words to speak in verse number 9. You know, that's because, I mean, the king is being very serious. He says, I want to know my dream and interpretation. He's demanding that of them. But yet, he also understands, I believe, that... They've already prepared, they have prepared remarks to give him. And that's what he's saying in verse number 9. That's why he's threatening death. He's threatening to destroy them and because he is serious. You understand, this is, he, um, he was troubled. Um, and the point I guess I want to bring out here at this point is, you know, h human learning or human wisdom, that's what, these four groups had. That's what the Chaldeans had. They had human wisdom. It has little to offer. Human learning or human wisdom, when separated from the divine truth, has little to offer. And some verses that, you know, that really reveal this is 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let me read you some of these verses in verse 25, it says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man. The fool, not that God is ever, there's not any foolishness in God, but even if, <laughs> and it goes on, the, and the weakness of God is stronger than any man. You, this, is, this is telling us just how frail man's wisdom really is. The best that the Chaldeans could have offered the king isn't any match for God's wisdom. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. And why is this? It says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. This dream, this interpretation could only be revealed spiritually, and that's where the, we see all of human wisdom, all of these groups could offer nothing to the king, dis, despite his demand. And here's the advice to the man who trusts in his own wisdom. Babylon was the center of human wisdom at this time. 
The king has before him the astrologers, the magicians, the, the, uh, the Chaldeans, the wizards. He has all the wisest men, all the wisdom that the world has to offer standing before the king, and they can't help him, and the king knows that. And that's why Jeremiah said in chapter 9, verse 23, he said this, to those that trust in themselves, in their own wisdom, in the wisdom of the world. He said this, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, righteousness in all the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Now, these advisors that were before King Nebuchadnezzar, they normally would have, they wanted the king to give them something, right? You can see, at least twice we see them ask, well, just reveal to us the dream. So they're trying to draw out something from the king, and that's a, you know, a, a that really what is, they were trying to draw that out and they're probably trying to employ lots of different techniques to get, well, what was it about? Where were you? You know, getting some sort of fact, draw out enough information to come up with some kind of prediction or some kind of guess. So what happened? Well, let's read on. Verse number 10. Verse number 10 tells us this, the Chaldeans answered before the king and said, There is not a man upon the earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, Lord, or excuse me, therefore, there is no king, Lord, nor ruler that asks such things at any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And it is a rare thing that the king requireth and there is none other that can show it before the king, except the gods who dwell, who, who, whose dwelling is not with flesh. You know, they're, they're saying the truth here. I mean, they're saying, king, this is a ridiculous request, first of all. No king in all of history has ever demanded something like this. But, and that obviously, and we're going to get, that disappoints the king. But look in verse number, um, verse number 11 here. Although understand that these wise men that were standing before the king, these were idolaters. They were ignorant of the one true God. But they were smart enough to know, and verse number 11 tells me this, tells us this, that they were smart enough to confess that they're there are great mysteries in the universe that can only be known through supernatural means. Verse number 11, now they say there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods, small g, whose dwelling is not with flesh. You see, they were at a point where they're saying, okay, we, it doesn't matter what we say, we're just going to make up stuff. Our wisdom is, is inferior to this, but there has to be a God out there. They didn't know the one true God, but they said oh, this can only be interpreted. This can only be revealed, first of all, by something out there, some other supernatural means. Now, verse number 12 goes on. It says, for this cause, the king was angry. The king was angry and very furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. And the, decree, and the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain and they sought Daniel and his fellow, uh, fellows to be slain. So a decree goes out from the king. Now, both when you study history and also the word of God, the one thing that it reveals, both reveals very clearly, is that Nebuchadnezzar possessed a very cruel disposition. Um, so here, let me give you some scripture. First of all, Jeremiah. 
What was Nebuchadnezzar like? So now the wise men that stood before him admit they can't interpret. They can't reveal the dream, let alone interpret it. The king's disappointed. He issues a death decree upon them. The, king Nebuchadnezzar was, was extremely cruel. Look in Jeremiah 29, verse 22. It says this, the prophet Jeremiah writes, And of them shall be taken up a curse by all the captivity of Judah which are in Babylon, saying, The Lord make thee like Zedekiah and like Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire. Look at the, the cruelty of Nebuchadnezzar here. Now we're going to get to chapter number 3. Chapter number 3, we see another attempted roasting in the fire. Actually, in Daniel 3, the third verse down there. What does it say this? It says, uh, we know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego didn't fall down and worship this idol. And uh, The decree from the king there, this was common by Nebuchadnezzar. You didn't do what he wanted? What does he say? The end of verse number 6 of Daniel chapter number 3, casted them into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. This was common. He did it, uh, he did it with Zedekiah uh, and like Ahab, the uh, Jeremiah writes. Also look in Jeremiah chapter 39 and verse number 6. This was during the besiege of Jerusalem. It says, Then the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, slew the sons of Zedekiah in Rebla before his eyes. Also the king of Babylon slew all the nobles of, Jerus of, of Judah. So uh, killing was, was common for him. He was very cruel. Verse number 7, it's not just killing them, but it says, Moreover, he put out... Zedekiah's eyes. I mean, it didn't end just with, it was torturous. So, <laughs> you know, um, actually, uh, Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 6, probably describes um, the best, uh, gives us a good description of what his nature uh, was like. It says, For lo, I raise up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. See, not only Nebuchadnezzar, the whole nation uh, was, was bitter. They were known for this. They were wicked, killing. It goes on, so they marched through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. They were ruthless, hasty, Habakkuk says. Do you not think? I, always, I get the impression that Nebuchadnezzar was, would fly off the handle. Uh, as I read Scripture, he was, he was hasty, was he not? Like within a moment, throw him in the furnace, you know, get him out of my sight. And that's what's happening here in our chapter uh, number two. They don't give him, he doesn't give him much time. The wise men stand before him, they, they reveal we cannot, we don't know the interpretation there. We can't do it, king. Okay, here's the decree, go out and kill them all. Very hasty, very cruel. Think of, consider how weakened the, his kingdom would have become had this decree been carried out. You know, remember the educated class, the, this group that Daniel was a part of. They were the strong. They would have all been destroyed. I mean, not a wise thing for a king to do, but that's because he was hasty. He didn't think before he, he, re, he was very reactionary. <clears throat> now let's look at things maybe from Daniel's perspective and then what he did. Look in verse, we see his problem here, Daniel's dilemma. The dilemma is that they sought him and his fellows to be slain. So now they're coming after Daniel. Daniel may not have even known really what was going on. In fact, he didn't because we're going to see it was later revealed to him what was going on. He just knew, hey, what's this I hear? We're all going to be slain today. <laughs> what's going on? Verse number 13 tells us his dilemma. And, you know, um, Daniel was just serving the Lord, yet we see that Satan, he will work through wicked men to attack the servants of God. 
Here we see in Daniel's life. Now, we see the king. Now, we're looking at it now from Daniel. Daniel's going about his day, and now he's being out of nowhere attacked. You know, and that is why Paul writes this in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. This is yet another reason why we need to be praying for one another. We don't know, uh, you know, if any child of God who stands for the Lord, who's serving the Lord, could be attacked at any time. It's not just pastors. It's not just evangelists and missionaries. Like Paul says this in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 3, verse 1. He says, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. So Paul's desire was that people would pray for him because we know in the life of Paul, things would come out, he would be attacked, and the Satan works through wicked men. And Satan is working at this time through Nebuchadnezzar to take out Daniel. You know, Daniel was catching the attention of Satan here. And so, unbeknownst to Daniel what was going on, Satan was working through this situation to take Daniel out. But then, notice Daniel's composure here. His poise, the calmness that he reveals here in verse number 14. Look at this, it says, Then Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom, to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, which was gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the, cap the king's captain, here's how we know Daniel didn't know what was going on. Why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. You see, Daniel didn't know. He's like, what is going on with King Nebuchadnezzar? Where did this come from? You know, um, <laughs> He's talking to Arioch, and it's interesting. The name Arioch literally means chief of slaughterers. Very appropriate for his occupation, would you say? The king tells the captain of the guard, a man by the name of Arioch, known chief of slaughters, chief of the slaughterers, uh, go out, round up the wise men, slay him. Very um, appropriate name, if you ask me. It's kind of like Amy Freeze. She's a meteor meteorologist. <laughs> or uh, I was looking up some of these. Uh, Laura Ham. She's a deli manager. <laughs> so uh, we've got Arioc, chief of slaughterers. All right? You, but, but there was no fear. There was no panic with Daniel. Uh, no fear or panic. Notice he, he hears. Uh, we, we don't, I don't see that coming from Daniel. He's like, hang on, what's going on here? Tell me what's going on. You know, <clears throat> that's because Daniel knew the Lord. And Isaiah 26, verse 3, it says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Daniel's trust was in the Lord, and his mind was at peace, even though he was within probably minutes from being executed for something he didn't even know what was going on. Isaiah 30, verse 15, says, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest ye, or shall ye be saved, in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Proverbs 3.26, For the Lord shall be thy confidence. The Lord gives the chi His children confidence, quiet peace, perfect peace. Proverbs 14.26, In the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. His children shall have a place of refuge. You can rest in the Lord. You can trust in the Lord. doesn't matter what's going on around you. Also, 2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, um, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God doesn't want uh, you and I to be living life in fear, 
in uh, fear what's going on around. It doesn't matter what's going around you. This narrative here in chapter 2 uh, uh, in Daniel's life tells us this. He answered the, with counsel and wisdom. He wasn't panicked. He wasn't trying to hide or run from Arioch. No. He, he spoke to him, but he had confidence because he knew the Lord. Um, also, uh, 1 John 5, verse 14 tells us this. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Isn't it nice to know that we can go to the Lord in times like this? Daniel had courage, and we see that in the next verse. And Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation. See, Daniel did not, did, did not ask the king anything about the dream. So he probably got the king's attention there. What do you think the astrologers, the magicians went in? They, they walked into the king and said, King, tell me about the dream. Daniel didn't do that. He simply asked for time. Why did he need time? Daniel knew he needed time to pray about it. And so he just needed a little time to pray about it, and he didn't ask the king anything. And that really tells us what Daniel's plan was. It tells us something about Daniel's life. His policy for when he was confronted with, with an issue was to pray. In verse 17 and 18, it says this, After he went to the king for more time, it says, then Daniel went into his house and made the thing known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and they would, that they would desire mercies of the Lord, or excuse me, of the God of heaven concerning this secret, that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men in Babylon. Daniel didn't call a meeting to discuss the matter. He did not uh, form a committee start researching and uh, you know, to figure out what could the king have thought. No. What he did was he, he went to uh, his three friends and they had a prayer meeting. This actually is the first recorded prayer meeting that we find in the Bible. And, um, you know, Daniel was one who believed in prayer. He was one who believed in prayer. You know, I want to spend. I want us to look at this prayer meeting. So I'm going to go ahead. We're uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not going to have time to to finish this. That was Daniel's policy. It was his plan. You know, um, here he is. He gets. Uh, he he goes in and he gets some time from the king, and he goes back. And he we see this first prayer meeting. Uh, talked about in the Word of God. And just for the sake of time, I don't want to rush through this because I want to bring out some things that he says in these two verses that I think are really important, really important. You know, there was no fear or panic with Daniel. He knew who, uh, it was kind of like, um, isn't it Job who said, I know whom I have believed in. That's Daniel. Daniel knew who he had believed in. God had brought him through that first trial in his life when he was uh, being told, well, here you go, you've got to eat the portion of the king's meat and drink the wine that's offered to idols. Daniel had conviction. He knew that that was, that was wrong. God didn't want him to do that, so he stood up for what he believed in, and God saw him through it. And actually, uh, more than that, God blessed him for taking that stand. Now, unbeknownst, to Daniel, he's being led away to be killed. And he didn't, he's having to ask Arioch, what's going on? And so he's able, because he has that good testimony, he's able to go before the king, get a little bit more time, gets that. And then we're, next week, we're going to pick up where we, where we just are, are at in this story. We see Daniel go back. He finds his three friends, perhaps the four, you know, the, the, these are four men that we know know the Lord. And they said, okay, let's call a prayer meeting. And we're going we're gonna to pick up where we've left off here because there's a lot of really good stuff 
in the next few verses that we're going to look at. So anyway, why don't uh, we go ahead, we'll, we'll stop right there. Uh, you're dismissed, and we've got a little um, over 10 minutes before our morning service. So you're dismissed. <laughs>